Great. Uh, well, this is, uh, thank you for joining us today. We're doing an affiliation talk today for our noontime lecture. Uh, we have the guest of, of Anthony Maffa here as a professor of law at the University of Maine Law School. Uh, do you go by Anthony or Tony? I go by Anthony. Anthony. Well, welcome, Anthony. Uh, you are providing a talk, uh, <laughs> Private Environmental Nudges. Is yes, that right? that's right. Yeah. Great. Well, why don't I just turn it over to you? And, that's uh, perfectly fine. We'll get started here. Welcome. Yep. Um, all right. Let me just get my slides here. Sorry. Yeah, what was this? Okay. Um, so get this out of the box. All right. Uh, so I'm going to talk today about this paper uh, that I wrote uh, and published last year. Uh, it's called Private Environmental Nudges, but it it's a much broader concept than just one paper. Um, and uh, I'm interested to hear all of your perspectives on it, uh, given that, you know, so a lot of what I'm talking about is outside of law. Um, it, it, in many ways, it's it's not law at all. Uh, and so I, I think we'll have an interesting conversation uh, when it comes to that. But uh, the paper is uh, called Private Environmental Nudges. It was published in the Dickinson Law Review. If you're interested in looking at a hard copy, I have a million of these in my office. So if you want to come to any anytime you're at 304th Street, you're welcome to come grab one. Um, they still do this antiquated thing in law of sending you a bunch of reprints when I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but I have them. Uh, and so, uh, you know, I have a bunch of those if you're interested. So uh, let's just jump right in and talk about where this came from. So this paper was born out of just an experience I had in my daily life. Um, and you can see in, in these pictures, uh, the coffee shop where this experience happens. Uh, it's a coffee shop called Tandem in, in Portland. Uh, I've been going there for a long time for coffee. And I went in, uh, this was before the pandemic, I went in and found that they asked me to pay um, for a cup. Right. So you, you get you go in, you order a cup of coffee to go and they charged me uh, for the vessel in which they are serving the hot liquid, uh, which is in and of itself an unusual exchange, or at least especially at the time was a very unusual exchange this some five, six years ago now. Uh, you, you usually expect to get uh, the cup with your coffee. Uh, and and this for me, I kind of paused and thought, why, why are you doing this? And uh, the the owners of the coffee shop and I happen to be friendly, and I I had a long conversation with them about it, and it it, it was quite interesting that that their uh, decision to do this uh, was based not just on a whim, but on some concepts from behavioral economics that we commonly call nudges. Uh, and, and I'll talk a little bit more about nudge theory in, in a moment. But the 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 pricing scheme that was involved here was that they discounted or reduced the price of a cup of coffee in all of their shops, um, of which there are only two at the moment, but they discounted the coffee uh, in both shops by a quarter and then proceeded to begin charging folks that quarter if they wanted a cup with their coffee. So if it, the effect was if you brought your own vessel, uh, like something like this, right? You, uh, as I did this morning, you would be charged 25 cents than you would have prior to the implementation of this policy. But the policy wasn't styled as a 25 cent discount. It was, sty it was styled as an upcharge for uh, the cup. And the concept here, at least what they they were operating on is that that change in the in the in the default price would have a greater influence on behavior than simply offering the twenty five cent discount uh, on the cups. And so, uh, the first thing I want to talk about is whether or not they were right about that in this particular instance. And so, the answer, at least 
prior to the pandemic was definitively yes. So this is data from their um, that they gave me from their coffee cup sales. And it's a percentage of the drinks that they sell in their coffee shops uh, that were sold in single use cups over time. And you have a 2018 average there of 70%. And then you have every month's data from uh, 2019 up through December of 2019. So the, the from April through December, you have their data there. And it all is hovering, you can see around 43% uh, of cups, less than half of the, of the coffee is sold in single use cups uh, in 2019 when uh, nearly three quarters of the of the cups of coffee they sold in the prior year before the implementation of this policy uh, was sold in single use cups. And that is, I think, if nothing else, some evidence that this pricing scheme that they've implemented this nudge that that I'm that I'm identifying here had some effect on consumer behavior in their coffee shops. And granted, this, that I think it's worth noting here, that this all happened prior to the pandemic, and that in and of itself is uh, was a changed this whole policy. Uh, as you might imagine, during the pandemic, they had to go back to selling everybody single use cups. You could not use your own cup, and it, it all of my data, you know, from 2020 ended up being useless. So this is what I have. Um, you know, when the paper went to press, they had now have been re-implementing the policy as in 2023. And there's more data, but that I don't have that in the paper because the paper was published last year. But suffice to say that this suggests that this worked. Now, I, I wanted to provide a little bit of a foil to this story and talk about, well, what about maybe the, if they had just done a 25 cent discount, it would have done the same thing, right? So that gets us to uh, Starbucks. Now, Starbucks is not a perfect analog by any means for your local coffee shop, but it does provide uh, a nice uh, story here of trying the other policy, right? And so what what Starbucks did is they they uh, about some decade prior to the to this activity, they had decided that they they were going to set a goal of a five year goal of reducing personal. Uh, uh, you know, increasing the amount of cups sold in personal, what they're calling personal tumblers or reusable cups uh, by 2015 and serving 25% of, of their coffee uh, in reusable cups. So just, just as a matter of saying why this analog isn't perfect, I mean, look at this data. I mean, before Tandem even implemented this policy, they were selling they were meeting Starbucks's goals, but star the point is Starbucks had a modest goal of reducing their waste, and they were going to attempt to do this by offering a discount for people who purchased co coffee using their personal vessels. And th the the data and, and for some reason this slide doesn't show the the graphic in the correct way, but in the paper I have I have the full graphic from Starbucks uh, marketing materials and. It was staggeringly bad how how this policy did not work. Uh, they sold uh, reusable their coffee in reusable cups at less than two percent clip, even after the implementation of the discount policy. They had the discount policy had very little effect on the number of people who were purchasing coffee uh, in uh, reusable cups. And suffice it to say, even Starbucks, by the time I was writing this paper, started to think that maybe they should do something along the nudging lines and avoid uh, because because the discount policy wasn't working as originally framed. And that's where it, we, we see Starbucks going now. Um, there There's a couple pilot programs where they are charging for cups in Starbucks locations, and that's because it wasn't working uh, to offer just the discount. So uh, all of this is to say that it, that this is just an example of a policy by a local business that was uh, innovative in res in the respect of trying to reduce their waste through uh, you know a, basically an alternate pricing scheme that has exactly the same economic effect but has a different behavioral effect, and that brings me to what this what what we're talking about here in a larger sense, and that is. <clears throat> 
the concept uh, merging two different concepts. So w when I began to write this paper, as you know, after I took a look at this sort of initial problem and this this sort of story between these two ways of looking at the same problem, I I looked at the literature, at least in law, around these things, and and I identified two gaps in that literature that this paper is trying to fill. One of them is this a larger question about behavioral informed policy, and uh, in other words, nudges, and whether those nudges are part of what the larger uh, universe of environmental policy that we call private environmental governance. And so my first question was, is nudging part of env in, in environmental governance or private environmental governance? And then my second question is, uh, was how do small and medium-sized firms fit into the private environmental governance story, right? So uh, as I mentioned, you know, you have the I'm contrasting this with a large enterprise Starbucks. Much has been written about Starbucks efforts in environmentally and other large corporations. Not very much has been written about small to medium sized enterprises. And, and my question was really not, are they doing this? I think it's pretty clear that they are, but does it matter that they're doing this? And why does it matter that they're doing this if so? And so I want to start with that latter question, then we'll jump back into the PG stuff for just a second, because I want to emphasize a couple of reasons why it, I think it does matter. First of all, I want to point out that, mo the again, that the majority of the literature on private environmental governance, at least in law reviews that uh, and law professors that are writing about this, focuses on companies that are much, much larger than your local coffee shop. Indeed, we're talking mostly about a lot of literature focused on companies like Walmart uh, that are operating on a global scale, massive uh, massive expenses, huge amount of impact for their company itself, right? And so uh, there's this whole <laughs> this whole body of literature on this, and most of that literature focuses on corporate boardrooms, uh, reporting by those companies, policies that you see um, advertised on large corporations' websites, and the 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 beginnings of these. Uh, third party organizations uh, efforts to uh, for a better for lack of a better word sort of measure uh, the, the company's performance on these environmental metrics against their promises right so you have um, some of you might be familiar with um, you know some of these efforts right and so uh, you, you might have heard of B benefit corporations or B Corp or B and B Lab, for instance, that measure some of these things. And, and in the climate space, we talk a lot about climate disclosures and scope one, scope two, scope three, emissions disclosures, and how and and this is all part of the private environmental governance literature. What wasn't really part of that literature, at least in in my in, in legal academia, was what small operators were doing uh, and whether that was what whether that was relevant. And so that was where I wanted to focus my efforts, right? So, and the, the reason that I, that I, there are a couple of reasons why I think that, and why I argue that small operators are of importance. That, and, and I'm gonna boil them down to just sort of the two big ones. The first one is aggregation, right? So we have a number of, we have many, many more small businesses than we have large businesses. I think that's uh, relatively apparent. If you add them, their effects up, there is a substantial effect on our environment, whether we're talking about carbon emissions or waste or any number of other environmental contributions that these businesses make. And so we we can think about it as relevant just from the sense of individual participation in, in the market, just in the same way that, that some would argue that our individual carbon emissions, our carbon footprints as human, individual human beings is a relevant metric. So too is the metric, are those metrics as applied to small businesses, which are just, uh, you know, in a sense, just conglomerations of individual car carbon footprints in the, in the corporate world. The second reason, and, and I think the more interesting reason, is th this concept of innovation and what I what I call, uh, you know, sort of the fe the federalist model of the United States ma mapped onto capitalism, and and by that I mean there's this concept in federalism uh, 
called laboratory that, that we say that states are the laboratories of democracy. And by that, we mean that states, uh, when they innovate on policy, can be examples and test cases for other states to then follow or learn from and change their approach to a particular problem. Well, in, in the corporate world, in the private environmental governance world, small operators can be those innovators that are the test cases, right? And then the policy can diffuse by after the test has, or the hypothesis has proven true. And just to give you an example, you know, this, this coffee shop implemented this policy in Portland well before Starbucks embraced it uh, on a corporate level in, in recent years. It, this is not to say that Starbucks uh, sending operatives out in, into Portland to figure out that this was the way to, de to deal with their waste problem. But, you know, the more coffee shops that do this, the more and the, you know, the more retailers that do this with respect to their packaging, et cetera, the more uh, it's proven effective in terms of reducing waste, perhaps increasing efficiency uh, by smaller operators, the more uh, larger global corporations are going to pay attention. Even Starbucks, when they implemented this policy, you can see from this slide, they did so on a trial basis in very particular locations. They didn't do it worldwide. And that in and of itself is evidence of this idea of, you know, taking innovative, innovative policies and testing them out. And so if we have a smaller, more entrepreneurial, likely more accepting of risk, and enterprises engaging in more environmental governance or more interesting environmental governance and a, a particular concern to me of this behaviorally informed environmental governance, then perhaps we'll see larger organizations engage in that as well. And so for those reasons, I thought that this is an area, at least these entities are at efforts are worthy of study. So then that brings me back to the, to the primary question that I was seeking to investigate here, which is what, how does nudging fit into the landscape of what we call private environmental governance? And uh, we have, uh, like I said, there's a, a good body of literature uh, sort of founded by this guy, Michael Vandenberg uh, from, 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 Vanden, from Vanderbilt uh, and a paper in the Cornell Law Review almost a, a decade ago now, who first coined this term private environmental governance, at least as applied uh, to legal scholarship. And his literature kind of lays the framework for what, what we mean by private environmental governance and why we why we care about it as, as law professors, at least. So it, it, let me just say that, that what I, uh, that the best way to think about this is to break down the phrase private environmental governance into its into its constituent parts. So we have private, environmental, and governance. It's pretty obvious what we mean by environmental, right? It has to do with an environmental impact or an environmental benefit. The, the uh, private piece of this just means to distinguish the activity from government, uh, from public government activity, right? So this isn't compelled by like regulation or law. So then that leaves, I think, the most difficult question, which is, uh, the boundary between like a governance activity and what we would ca characterize as just ordinary market behavior. And primarily when we're talking about it, nudges, at least, what I mean is marketing versus governance. And the line adm is admittedly a sort of fuzzy one, right? And wh where I, where I want to draw that line is where the activities uh, are uh, restrictions on behavior in some way that are uniformly imposed uh, throughout a company's operations, as opposed to sort of messaging or something that's meant to suggest that the consumer do something. This, the, these governance activities are, when I use that, that term here, it, private governance activities, I mean decisions that are that that come down from whoever's in charge and that have uniform applicability throughout the corporation and and if they affect consumers uniformly to all consumers that interact with that business right so we think about things like and and what I'll do is I'll spend some time 
talking about how nudges uh, fit into that equation in just a moment and the different types of nudges that I've identified. But, but my primary question is, are nudges part of this governance, this type of governance at all, right? And so it's, it's worthwhile to just make sure that we all understand where what what i mean by nudges nudges is a term that that uh comes from Cass sunstein and richard thaler um and they they coined that term a long time ago and it, it's a it's a term that means a, a basically to affect choice architecture in a way that alters people people's behavior uh in a predictable way without forbidding completely any options or significantly changing their economic incentives, right? So in other words, when we say choice, choice architecture, we mean the framework that we use to make decisions, right? And so if we can have a policy that affects that framework uh, and leads people to perhaps a different choice uh, without telling them that they have to make that choice, then we have... Uh, effectuated a notch, at least that according to very simply, according to Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein. And, and they have a whole bunch of different examples of how nudging works. And, and Cass Sunstein spent a whole lot of time in the federal government uh, trying to concoct or or infuse behaviorally informed uh, regulations, infu infuse the federal government with some behavioral economics in terms of their, their regulatory design. And what I'm talking about is trying to infuse, or at least observing the infusion of behaviorally behavioral economics informed policies at in the private environmental governance space. And so, what does that look like? It is my it is the question that that I ultimately set out to ask and answer uh, in the in the the last section of this paper and. And I identified in the paper uh, four archetypes uh, that I want to focus on, and I want to talk about them in, in in relation to one another. But let me just give you, as, as a way of introduction, let me give you one more example. And I think this example is interesting because it's, it's even more current than my coffee cup example, and that is the fuel efficient routing on Google Maps. You probably have all seen this now as the, and what this is, uh, if you haven't, is that now when you go to route from one place to another using Google Maps as your GPS program, the first route that, that Google will suggest for you, it will be the most fuel efficient route. And you will see a little indicator telling you that it's the most fuel efficient, both in words and a little symbol. And it you can see on this, example that it is not the fastest route. This is a change from Google's initial default routing. It used to route you on the fastest route first and perhaps give you other options, maybe not initially, not even telling you if those options were more fuel efficient uh, other than just to indicate the number of miles you would have to travel for those other options. It, Google it, it is... I, I admittedly somewhat late to this game. There were other uh, GPS programs uh, designed uh, by other programmers that attempted to do this specifically, right? Targeting consumer groups that cared about the fuel efficiency of their routes and creating routes for them specifically for the purpose of achieving fuel efficiency. Google recognized that that was something that they uh, this is a way that they could influence behavior and adopted this nudge such that now you don't, you still have a choice in routes, which is why this is still just a nudge, right? It's not, it's not fully restricting your behavior, but what it does is it changes the default route that you're going to be assigned. If you do nothing, you will go the most fuel efficient way. And presumably that will have a significant environmental impact uh, or at least some environmental impact, and that impact will will be positive. So, let me talk for a moment about the different types of uh, of uh, nudges that I've identified, and then characterize them on a couple of different scales. So, one scale I'll I'll characterize them on has to do with the type of decision making process that the nudge is influencing. And we talk about that process. You can see that here on the y-axis, right? Uh, 
automatic decisions uh, and deliberative decisions. And what I mean by that is how, and forgive me for the scientists, no, there's no, uh, this is a philosophical relational chart. It has no, there's no data behind this. It's not, there's no, you know, math putting nominal fees exactly in that place. I'm just trying to show you uh, the relationship using a graphical a depiction. So uh, again, automatic decisions, deliberate decisions, I think that's fairly straightforward. The further you go on that scale, the more time we're spending making that decision, right? Uh, and then soft paternalism to hard paternalism has to do with the the uh, intensity of the nudge, let's say. You know, it, a soft paternalistic nudge will do the least to seemingly, seemingly restrict your decision, even though it's not in actuality ever restricting your decision, the softest version of, of a nudge doesn't even give the appearance of restricting your decision. Whereas the hardest version, the hard, most paternalistic version does seem to restrict your decision, although it really doesn't. So uh, let me characterize these uh, or describe these different types of nudges that I've identified and, and see if, if that can bring some clarity to this. So priming. Priming is the idea that we provide the consumer, the decision maker, with information about their decision, in this case, information about the environmental impacts of their decision prior to them making their decision. Information that we know from studies would be useful to them that they would care about if they cared about the environmental impacts of their decision, which they, which often they do. Uh, but that they are not otherwise accessing. They're not putting the time in to access it. We, the corporation who's providing this information wouldn't be readily providing that without the idea that they're perhaps nudging the consumer. So, you know, providing things like, uh, you know, uh, the example that gets used very frequently in this space is, uh, you know, priming people with the nutrition information about, food decisions, right? But now we're starting to see that come into the climate space where people are being primed with the carbon footprint of dining decisions as well. Uh, and that's that's a priming decision because it's providing people with more information, right? Reframing is, the, is all about the way that decisions are presented or information and, and decisions are presented to uh, to the person making the decision. And by that, I mean, visually or auditorily or both, right? So you think about the way that a menu is designed or uh, the way that that we see something uh, when we are, are making a, a, a purchase decision, right? Where are things positioned on the shelves? That kind of thing, right? Nominal fees is all about that is, is what I, the example I began with is the perfect example of this. This is small, relatively in, inconsequential fees associated with with just the the less environmentally friendly decisions and in this case you know we see a fee being charged for the cups in my primary example that there you can point to the bag fees as as private governance prior to you know regulation making those mandatory um those kind of things that's that's a nominal fee changing defaults is just is what I just talked about. You know, the Google example is a classic one of this, right? Where, where the consumer is, and and this is in, in particularly important when you're talking about automatic decisions, of which you know which route to take is can frequently be an automatic decision. You just plug it in and you go and follow whatever it tells you. You don't have time to deliberate on which of the routes you would prefer. Always, uh, ch the de changing a, the, whatever the default is is massively influential to the in terms of the individual environmental impact of that decision and so these are, you can see how they may how they fall on this scale changing defaults is important for automatic decision making cuz otherwise you're going to have a hard time influencing that automatic decision making but it's awfully paternalistic it's awfully paternalistic it's it's essentially making the decision for the consumer based on the idea that you uh, as the operator know know what they would prefer right and then forcing them to opt out of your preferred choice now people criticize this as paternalistic but as long as there still remains some 
choice to opt out, we don't have, uh, you know, it's not true paternalism. And, uh, you know, the, the a classic example that Cass Sunstein and Richard Thaler use here, you, some of you may be aware, uh, is organ donation forms on the back of your, uh, or or when you get your driver's license, right? M people, uh, if, if the default has changed so that you will do be an organ donor, many more people uh, sign up or, or agree to stay in the program rather than opt out of it, right? That's, and and you see, and, and in the environmental space, what some of these nudges that we're, that I'm talking about here are trying to do is to make the most, in, the least impactful or the most environmentally friendly option, depending on how you want to think about it, be the default. And just uh, to, to go back to where I started this whole thing, right? The coffee cups, right? The, the default in America even to this day, is that you go to a coffee shop and if you were getting coffee to go, they will give you a cup to go with that coffee, right? It, it is not the norm to have your own cup. It, and if you have your own cup, people still some would, would expect potentially to get a discount for having their own cup because they're saving the business money. They're not having to purchase a cup and, and for you. Well, the 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 default shift here is that we expect people to bring their cups that's the default and if you don't have one then you have to pay to get one and that's uh you know you combine the the nudge at the beginning of this as my primary example is a nudge that combines changing that default with a nominal fee associated with the cup and you end up with a potentially impactful uh, private governance measure now the other thing that I'm uh, the other the other metric that I put this on uh, besides you know the paternalism scale is I also look at the cost of the nudge from the perspective of the uh, enterprise putting it in place right so uh, changing defaults uh, could have a relatively low cost uh, to to the entity uh, think about about the Google Maps example you know that costs Google re almost nothing to change between the routes that it was already spitting out, uh, which one is the primary display for the consumer, but it makes, it can make a difference. Contrast that with, you know, the priming nudge that I, that I gave uh, that example, where you're providing the consumer with more information about the impacts of their decision. Well, that costs you money to provide them information. Not only do you have to find that information yourself, you have to translate that information into a way, into a, into a method mm -hmm. that, uh, of delivery and presentation that is digestible for the consumer, uh, and then circulate that information throughout. Like if, if you're a large corporation, all of your locations, train your employees on 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 uh, delivering that information. Perhaps answering questions about that information. It can be quite expensive. You know, reframing. Similarly, you're talking about the lo most likely talking about physical infrastructure. If we're talking about businesses that 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 have brick and mortar locations, you have to change the physical infrastructure, the signage uh, at your location. Nominal fees are an example of something that is really hard to pin down on the cost spectrum, right? Because as I mentioned in the very beginning, right, the the idea behind the fees that Tandem was charging for the cups is that you have no economic effect, right? The economic effect is the same as if you offered a discount. Well. The economic effect, if you offer a discount, it depends on what uh, on on what the costs are associated with cups. Whether or not you know, if everyone decides to uh, to to bring their own cup and there thereby pay less for coffee than you were previously charging, are you losing money as a result of that uh, that uh, initiative? That that's a that's a question that depends on the, on the economics of a particular situation. It it is. Are you losing business because people don't want to pay that nominal fee, right? That's another question there. It, it's it's likely that the cost will, will remain low if, if your nominal fee is small enough that it makes people maybe think twice or influences their behavior, but isn't so substantial as to really impact them in terms of their their financial situation, right? That's the idea of the fee being what, what I'm calling nominal rather than a, a real tax or a substantial fee associated with a particular choice, right? And so 
I want I, I, I began to classify it on these dimensions for uh, for a couple different reasons and, and I and I'm going to wrap here in just a moment. One is is that I think it's useful as an academic exercise to begin to synthesize these different strains of thought about uh you know private it, private businesses influencing our behavior and the environment. And so we're spending much more time because of the inaction, frankly, in the United States of, of the federal government on things like climate. We're spending much more time talking about, writing about, thinking about how private enterprises are are going to be part of uh, hopefully a, some sort of a solution or at least a way forward on cutting our carbon emissions. And if we're going to think about that, we should really think about all of the tools uh, of design, of regulatory design that the government, hey, which is which is the first actor here, was thinking about and should be thinking about. And Kaz Sunstein and Richard Thaler have for a long time, uh, particularly Kaz Sunstein, been arguing that the federal government should be thinking about behavioral economics when it's making regulatory decisions. And I argue that so too should uh, businesses that are engaged in private environmental governance efforts. And so thinking about how the dimensions of that decision from the business's perspective is a lot of what these charts are supposed to be doing, right? Thinking about what type of decisions their consumers are making, thinking about how their the perception of their company and and their and their methods uh, and their policies and on on a scale of paternalism, and thinking about the cost to their bottom line of those potential policies, and and, and then using that information together with the projected environmental impacts of of the nudge that they're hoping to implement can they can make an informed sort of decision about this so you have the, the ac academic piece of it to, that's thinking about how the fields are merging but and then you have the practical side of it which is that these conversations are not just happening in academia now they're happening in boardrooms and this i think is a useful way to think about some of these decisions so i'll stop there um, and open it up to questions. And, and I'm happy to to talk more about this. Um, I've, I spent a lot of time thinking about it and I'm interested to hear what you all think. Thanks very much, Anthony. Uh, I guess we have some time for uh, questions to open it up to people. Another question, Anthony. Th thanks very much for the talk. Um, yeah, um, I'm at, I'm in CCI, obviously, and uh, yeah. more research scientist. Um, but I guess my just from your thought process on this, you know, ways paths forward to to try to help businesses recognize these these changes. Um, I think that's always the the from a, like a social perspective, people don't like change and they they struggle with risks to their business um, and you know, any four of those might have some component of risk associated with it, with it right? So, you know, what what's your recommendations for paths forward on how we engage with businesses for this private type effort? That's a great, that's a really good question. And, and I think it in many ways depends on the business you're talking about, right? There are some businesses that recognize that their consumers are are much more concerned about environmental impacts than others. And, and for those businesses, I would argue, you know, if they don't think about this, they're going to be left behind by companies that are thinking about this, right? But then there are also other businesses which, which are much more generic and don't have that consumer base that that they recognize as being disproportionately concerned about the environment. Like take the major automakers, for example. You know, they're kind of trying to cater to everyone, and why should they care about what the decisions of their consumers are from an environmental perspective? other than that they also might care about the planet that we live on. And that's a hard question to answer. Uh, one thing I would say is that, uh, and I spent some time talking about this in the paper, is that uh, in some sense, a lot of marketing it, and a, is, is already doing this. And certainly there are already defaults, right? And so some, the one of my entry points when I'm talking to folks in the business world about this is to get them to think about like, well, what, why did they choose the defaults that they chose in the first place? Like, were they intentional at all? Or did they just, that was just the first thing that came up, 
right? And so what are the metrics that they're using to decide the default parameters of whatever their product is? And I'll go back to the Google Maps example. You know, probably they were like, well, people want to know the fastest way. That's why we decided on that being the way that we would make the default, right? But not every company can point to a decision-making process that led to their default. It might've just been the first thing that that came, the first idea that they had. And so forcing them to, at least from their own perspective, interrogate their defaults is, I think, a good place to start. The other thing I say, I often say uh, in, on this is to, to just use, and I use the plastic bag charge example as, as, as my example of this is, you know, some of these things will start as nudges that private businesses are doing voluntarily and then end up as government regulation forcing them to do it. And the business is better positioned to handle that government regulation or thinking about these things before the, and, and implementing them before the government did it. And, and you look at and, and, the, and you look like a good guy. You get no environmental credit, uh, at least from people, consumers that care about this for just complying with the law. It's not like Hannaford is all of a sudden seen as green because they're charging five cents for a plastic bag in Portland. You know, everyone is charging five cents for a plastic bag in Portland. You know, if they had implemented that bag charge prior to that, maybe they would have been seen that way if they if they took like a Whole Foods like approach or something like that. So, uh, you know, it's just those are the two things I usually say when I get when I get pushed on that, uh, you know, by people in the corporate world. But even then, you know, as I said at the beginning, you know, larger the corporation, the more skeptical they are of of doing this kind of thing, especially using nudging. Cool. Thanks. Hey, Anthony, if I can jump in. So I, I had no idea you were interested in this kind of stuff. That's really funny. It's uh, really consistent with my work. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, it's really important in thinking about the, all of the emissions that are embodied in these products, right? And how much um, mitigation potential there is associated with product reuse or waste reduction. So really cool stuff. But I wondered, since this is an affiliation talk um, for CCI, if you could also talk a little bit more about the heart of your 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 research in tort law and how that relates to climate policy. I just thought that'd be really useful for folks to have a broader sense of of where the heart of your research lies. Yeah, sure. So uh, thanks, Sydney, for that question. So this is a little bit of an outlier for me. I don't usually write about economics. Most of my my work is about uh, you know various legal approaches uh, and traditional legal approaches to dealing with with problems like primarily climate change in recent years. And I I teach torts, uh, which is if you're not familiar with that sort of the broad category that describes civil lawsuits, personal causes of action. Um, and so I think a lot about uh, how those interact with current climate policy. Um, and you look at uh, the paper, I one of the papers I'm most, uh, the, my most recent paper on, on that subject has to do with, if, you, if you're familiar with CERCLA and Brownfields litigation, kind of taking that concept and applying it to climate adaptation litigation. So if you look at what's going on in Baltimore, Hawaii, there's about 30 different um, lawsuits out there right now trying to get money damages for expected climate impacts or already felt climate impacts. Some of them are brought by states, some of them are brought by uh, cities. Uh, th those pieces of litigation are very similar in terms of what they're trying to do that, uh, to you know the initial litigation that was trying to get money to clean up brownfields, uh, brownfields being contaminated in at former industrial sites. And what happened in the CERCLA program is the federal government set up a co federal cause of action through CERCLA to do that uh, and kind of systematized and, and, and um, made uniform what those causes of action looked like and the, the elements in the pleading and the type of defenses available, et cetera. And I envision what I call a CARLA, which would be a climate adaptation uh, version of, of CERCLA. Um, and that paper uh, just came out in Harvard Environmental Law Review. And I'm, that's the idea behind that is to try to, to um, come up with some sort of uniformity. And in that paper, I suggest that there is, as if one of these climate cases hits, it, or just, and even the mere existence of them and them not being dismissed, um, creates incentive 
to reach a compromise at the federal level, a compromise that would, uh, you know, uh, that would essentially make nullify all the state level causes of action and create one cause of action in federal court that had uniform elements across the country that communities burdened by climate impacts could could use to bring their litigation and uh you know in doing so you could get the the, the way to get the sort of defendants in, in and their supporters in congress on board with that program is to is to create a situation where you you preempt all the state law causes of action right so they're instead of defending you know disparately defending in 50 different states with the potential for one uh judgment in the billions of dollars in each of those states and who knows kind of punitive damages a, a lot of unpredictable elements there you create some level of predictability and maybe they're on board with that essentially like a global settlement uh, or sorry not global national settlement through through a cause through a piece of legislation um that that paper um you know has uh is my most recent foray into that but i've done i've also written about um sort of culpability for murder for lack of a better way of describing it of 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 uh you know sort of the corporate and government actors um when they because the science is relatively clear that people will die uh, if we don't do something about climate change and the fact that they're not doing something suggest is there's a level of culpability there that at least in torts you know knowing is enough to 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 rise the level of intentionality um, and the criminal law is a little different, but there's there are, I go through criminal causes of action in that paper as well. That's an old paper at this point, but um, you know it's it's just becoming relevant again because people are having that conversation, those conversations again. So I, I could keep talking about my work, but that's generally <laughs> generally what I do uh, and write about and talk about with my students, um, you know, at the law school. Um, I have a couple of questions as well. Um, sure, go ahead. Thanks for the talk, Anthony. I would also invite you to talk about sort of the courses you teach and sort of other interactions. Uh, Anthony's gone to uh, COP with us last year as well, so you can please share those bits as well so we can know how to refer either students or others to you. Um, my two questions about your talk are about the local and the international. So when you think about um, private environmental nudges, um, Portland is different than Orono, is different than um, Ohio, uh, Cincinnati. What, you, you choose your location. And so yeah. having a nudge in Portland uh, is also relative to the audience that's being nudged, right? And right. I have a sense that Portlandites um, might be easier to be nudged in the direction that you're uh, yeah. suggesting than others. Um, right. and, and the success of the policy then is based on that, right? Is based yeah. on the audience, either they're priming <laughs> or their, their backup for this. Um, so I'd love to hear how you think about that in terms of it. Um, I mean, a Tandem was a really interesting framing, but then scaling up to uh, Starbucks is, is exactly that, right? Like, yeah, what, yeah. The, um, I, I, mean, I, I wanna think um, on the opposite side, international, like you're thinking yeah. about domestically, maybe even governments taking over some of these regulations. How do we think about like internationally nudging different policies in that way. I can just give an example from the migration sector is that like we have been trying for years to get more resettlement of refugees. Um, Obama after 2016 said, great, we're gonna have a big conference about this, but if you wanna come to the leaders summit where you get your picture with me, you have to come up with a higher pledge than you ever would have before. And he used yeah. his sort of social capital and other wings to like, nudge them to go even higher than before. And so you could imagine a special club at COP next year where like you want your picture with Biden, you have to come up with higher emissions reductions, right? Yeah. I, not that great of an example, but how can you envision it in, in the international sphere? Yeah, no, that's those are both great questions. So let me take the the first one, the, the differences in consumers. Uh, and, I'll, and I'll just answer that with a bit of a dodge, but to say this, Richard Thaler and Cass Sunstein the research on this suggests that, that no matter where you go, consumers are pretty bad at acting on their express preferences. And by that, I mean, if you poll, if you survey them about what types of attributes they care about when they're making, when they're making a decision in the abstract, you put them in a lab and you say, okay, 
here's a survey about what what types of qualities do you want your product that you're going to purchase to have and they will frequently weight things like environmental performance quite high but then when they go when they actually their their purchasing decisions never do hardly ever reflect that level of weight and there's a lot of reasons for that and you could we can debate those but we don't have time to debate all of them but suffice it to say that I think no matter where you went in the country, there's some amount of this nudging. There, this nudging would have some effect. I agree with you that the effect is greater in places that are more receptive, for sure. Um, but I think there's some baseline level of of dissonance between people's expressed preferences when polled or surveyed on them and their actual purchasing decisions, and we can try to close that gap with nudging. That's that's Sunstein and Thaler's like primary, one of their primary insights. On the second question of international significance, I think all of these concepts can be, as as again, Sunstein argues elsewhere, can be applied to, to government actors as well as private actors. You know, the behavioral economics insights here are, are relevant. And I think your idea is an interesting one, like, hey, get a picture, <laughs> maybe you get a, a little bit more. And it, it's sort of facetious, but actually it like, it is, you they're doing this to some extent without even acknowledging that they're doing it if you think about the way like geopolitical relationships work right they, then you it's sort of a a funny example like the photo op thing but that is often how leaders operate right they you know they will refuse to meet with the person until they agree to certain conditions or bring the, bring their um bring their certain uh, certain pieces of policy up to up to a level that the 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 you know United States or UK leader or G8 whatever thinks is acceptable. Um, look at what's happening, sort of the shaming, um, rightfully that's being directed at at the Russian government uh, in the wake of the invasion of Ukraine. Like uh, that's some of that you could characterize it as like behaviorally informed uh, activities, uh, but they're probably not saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but so, and again, that gets to my point at the end of what my talk, where I was saying maybe we should think about, we should be more intentional when we're doing these things because we're and and a little bit at Seth's question, you know, there a lot of actors are doing this stuff without even realizing they're doing it. So maybe we should be more thoughtful about our approach because it actually does ha have influence on on behavior. Um, and then just to lastly to go back to your where you started, just to give some some more insight into like what I do with my students. Yeah, so I've I've as as Cindy and, and Nick have both mentioned, I um, have been bringing some law students to COP um, with some CCI folks uh, last year and, and again this year um, at, at the law school. I teach our our climate law and policy class, um, which of which the students that are coming with us this year all, all took with me. Um, but I also teach a corporate social responsibility in the environment class. I teach the basic environmental law class. I teach a natural resources class as well. Um, and so, you know, I kind of, I have a lot of that curriculum. I often, I have done some water law courses um, with GMRI and with Casco Bay, Friends of Casco Bay that are more practical in focus, um, in, in particular focusing on ocean acidification and um, carbon removal uh technology um in 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 casco bay um so that's the kind of thing i do um i advise a lot of students on their on their own research and writing in these areas especially as it relates to uh you know the law and i got a lot of students writing about local government um and state government efforts because of the dearth of sort of federal activity but that that's kind of that's very quickly what i do Well, Anthony, thank you very much. We are about out of time. Uh, thank you very much for joining us today. It's very interesting to hear uh, what you've been working on, and we look forward to engaging with you in the future. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, everyone, for listening. Good to see you all. Anthony. Thank, thank you. you. Bye.